Good afternoon and welcome to the College of Continuing and Professional Studies webinar, Leading Through Uncertainty. Thank you so much for joining us today. Next slide, please. It's a pleasure to have you all here this afternoon. My name is Lisa Beckham and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. If you have future questions about this webinar or other programs we offer, contact information will be on the last slide of this presentation. Next slide, please. There are some logistical items, excuse me, I'd like to address before we begin. I ask that you please submit your questions throughout the webinar so we can address them during the Q&A portion of this presentation. To submit your questions, click the Q&A button towards the bottom of your screen, type your question and select enter or return on your keyboard. There's also live captioning available, available for viewing if you click on the CC button towards the bottom right side of the screen. Next slide, please. We will send an email with a link to the recording of this webinar. The link will be sent to the email address you submitted during registration. Next slide, please. I'm so delighted to introduce the topic for today's webinar, Leading Through Uncertainty. During this prolonged period of change and uncertainty, employees look to leaders for clear direction. This puts pressure on leaders to provide communication that will engage and support employees and help them achieve their goals. The current work environment suffers from limited resources and uncertainty. Leaders need to encourage adaptability, innovation, and resourcefulness to help employees be successful. During this webinar, we'll explore communication techniques to support and engage employees, ways to tailor messages to fit the individual and situation, and tips to encourage innovation and resourcefulness. It's such a pleasure to introduce the presenter for today's webinar, Marilyn Corrigan. Marilyn has over 20 years of experience leading management development, employee development, and public affairs functions. She started her own consulting practice focusing on leadership, change, communications, conflict resolution, and career development. Marilyn consults and coaches throughout the U.S. and has worked in Australia on a multi-year leadership project. She has an M.A. in education from the University of Denver and a B.A. in psychology from Whitman College. Prior to working in business, Marilyn served in a nonprofit youth organization and an academic setting. Again, it's such an honor to have you here with us today, Marilyn, and thank you so much for being here to share your wisdom. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. When we think about the topic today in leading through uncertainty, we are in such challenging times. Everything is so uncertain. There's no roadmap. And we keep trying, we put a plan in place and then we're hit with something new and we have to redo the plan. And most people function much better with more predictability that they can plan for it. They put a plan in place and they can activate it. We're not in those times right now. And again, everybody is having to flow with whatever happens. Years ago, I was teaching in an MBA program and the, we used a book by Stephen Covey called Seven, um, effective, seven Habits of Effective People. And he talked about this model that he had really seems for me to fit into this topic. He said there were two circles and there's a circle of concern that we're all surrounded by and everything around us right now, all the media messages, everywhere we go, we have the circle of concern, whether we're frightened, excited, whatever. But in the circle of concern, we can't influence very much. It's just happening around us. But within that circle of concern, he came to a smaller circle and he called it circle of influence. And he said, what we need to do is to look within the circle of influence and say, what can we influence? What is within our control? What can we impact? And his goal is to say, start in that circle of influence and then try to expand it so that it gets larger within the circle of concern. So as I cover the topics today, I want you to think about the content, the tools, the ideas, and bring it into your circle of influence to be able to say, 
how can I use this in my immediate role and the work that I'm doing? So what I want to cover, as Lisa had said, I wanna look at your impact, some communication and messages that you can give to people that can help them during these times of uncertainty. A couple tips on what could make a safe environment, because when we're in a safe environment, our ability to listen is so much better. We need innovation because we don't know what to do and we need to try new things. So innovation becomes really critical and we're trying to do more with less. I always thought that was a big issue before. It is a major issue today. But then I wanna end the session bringing it back to you, which is really within that circle of influence. What can you do to take care of yourself? So let's start with looking at the fact that leadership is influence. Leadership is also relationship building, but think about leadership behavior and it's being able to inspire, sometimes nudging others, maybe sometimes pushing others, but how can we kind of guide people in the direction that we want them to go? We need to be able to be an advocate for others. I found when I was leading a department that one of my key functions was to not only be an advocate for my department so that other people in the organization knew what we could offer to them, but I also most importantly needed to be an advocate for my employees to have others understand their skills and their abilities, but also to help get barriers out of the way. Leadership behavior can come from any position. And I sometimes get frustrated in the consulting and teaching that I do, that a lot of times well, people will kind of look down and they'll say, I'm not the formal leader. I can't really do anything. And what I found is leadership behavior does come from any position. Think back over your career. How many times have you maybe not had a formal leader role, but you became an informal leader. You didn't seek it out, it just happened. And that others started to look to you. They would ask you to bring forward something. They would ask you to speak up for them. And as I've worked in different organizations, I have found in some cases, informal leaders not only have had a lot of good information to share with me, but many times they've demonstrated more leadership behavior than the formal leaders in that group have. So. Any of us can demonstrate leadership behavior. Think about being on a team. The team is kind of stuck. And all of a sudden, one of the participants speaks up, guides the group in a certain direction. That person is demonstrating leadership behavior. So what I would say to all of you is do not underestimate your ability to demonstrate leadership behavior, no matter what your role is. The challenge for all of us, whether leaders, influencers, we are in such incredible challenging times right now. And this has always been true though, where leaders need to be change agents and they're expected to be the promoters of the change. The challenge is the leaders many times are experiencing the same emotions that the employees are. And they're feeling the same frustrations and sometimes anger, but it's important for them to stay positive and to be an advocate for the change, even if they're struggling sometimes to believe and promote it. So it's a matter of what their role is and what the expectations are, but it is challenging because you still have a turmoil going on within you, but you need to sometimes hide that and conceal that from other people. So leadership is influence and it really leads to a relationship building. When we think about leadership, there's so many different skills. But when I look at the topic today on leading with uncertainty, I wanna focus on two primary skills, listening and empathy. And I think they're critical. Some people will say they're critical maybe, but they're in short supply. Others would say, wow, I hardly ever see them. I think listening and empathy are missing. So let me say a little bit more about each of these and challenge you to think about how you can use them more in your communication with people. Listening shows respect. In one of the organizations that I worked with, they came out with an ad campaign that said, we listen. And then they realized that vendors, customers, 
other people were going to start expecting that the employees of this organization did demonstrate listening, but most people have not had listening training. So they promoted an incredible listening program for all employees. I was involved in the training. I was sometimes loaned out to be a listening ambassador to share that program with nonprofits. And I will tell you that every time I worked with that program, I was really impacted by saying how powerful listening is and how few people really know how to do it very well. So when you can listen effectively, it's incredibly powerful. The most important part though, is that listening shows respect to another person. And if you're going to build relationships, having that respect is really important. So it helps to acknowledge the other person's position and their right to have their opinion, even if you disagree. We used to have this funny phrase in the class called, learn to agree to disagree agreeably. We're not seeing a lot of that, I think, demonstrated in today's general communication, but it's being able to acknowledge, as I said, the other person's right to hold their position, acknowledge the difference, but to also validate your own and knowing that it's different than the other person. You're not liable in a conversation to say, let's let this go and agree to disagree agreeably. It's not a phrase that would come out of our mouth. But I think so often we get caught trying to force our opinion on others rather than if we try and force our opinion on others, they may actually lock in their position. So I think it's better to acknowledge the difference. But if you really listen to that difference, you may find common ground that you didn't even realize was there. You may find you have values in common with the other person, but what your difference is around is on how you want to do something, not what you want to do. So listen for the common ground because that can help you find a way to collaborate. The other thing about listening is to demonstrate an interest in the other person. One of my positions was in public relations and learning about other jobs that people had. And I found if the interest I showed in someone was sincere and I asked some questions, they were so excited to share with me what they were doing. So showing an interest, but it has to be sincere, can be a powerful way of also demonstrating respect. So if you look at listening and breaking it down to a few qualities that I think are particularly needed today, it's, and it, this gets back to the agreeing to disagree agreeably, is being able to listen non-judgmentally. I think that is a major challenge. It's easier for us to try and judge somebody else, but it's important that we try not to judge because we're trying to honor where they're coming from. How can we better understand that is to ask open-ended questions, to probe and to get more information that gives us a better context. The key is to understand the message from their meaning, not ours. It's very easy for us to jump to our own interpretation of what they've said, but that may not be, our interpretation may not be their meaning. And so the only way we can do is to check that out and ask questions. As I've done some coaching and working with people in conflict situations, I've often found that where a lot of the conflict comes from is they have different interpretations of the same message and they just hurt each other differently. So it can help if they can get on the same page with each other. So again, that non-judgment, the probing, the open-ended questions, understanding the other person's meaning. And then in a moment, I'll talk about empathy. When you look at the open-ended questions and understanding the other person's meaning, as well as acknowledging their emotions. I learned a lot of this from a book that was called Communicating in Difficult Situations. And they really emphasized this, which got back to the listening. So let's look at the empathy. When we think about empathy, one it ties in with a lot of the work that's being done today on emotional intelligence. And one of the people who's quite known in that field is Daniel Goleman. 
I work with an instrument on emotional intelligence and one of the components of that instrument that people get feedback on is empathy. And a lot of hard driving leaders, when you say that they need to strengthen their empathy, they're like, wait a minute, I don't wanna go there. That's getting into people's emotions. That's the touchy feely stuff. I don't wanna do that because empathy is the ability to recognize and share other people's feelings. That can be a challenge for people because they're uncomfortable about the idea of doing that. But if you can demonstrate empathy, it can really spark that engagement. You have a connection with that person. They feel your support. Remember early on, I talked about inspiring others. It's a lot easier to inspire people if they believe that you're supporting them. And empathy can really show that compassion and that support. But again, a lot of people are like, this is kind of uncharted territory. They're not sure that they want to go that way of looking at people's feelings. So one of the things I appreciated about Goldman's work is he said there's three domains of empathy. One is the cognitive. That's the head approach. Then there's the emotional and then there's the empathetic concern. So if you think about the cognitive, as I said, that's the head. It's like, what's their perception? How are they looking at this? Well, it's a lot easier for people to kind of start there because it's more like, where are they coming from? What's their approach? That feels a little bit more analytical. And for many people, it feels safer. So if you can get them to say, where are they coming from? What's their perspective? Then it's easier to ask the next question, which is, wow, I wonder what emotions go with that perspective. Are they discouraged? Are they frustrated? Are they excited? Are they sad? Are they fearful? And so you indirectly lead yourself into the emotions because you started with the perspective. So to really try and understand that emotional part, because that's people, it's funny, but people don't realize that people's emotions are really facts to them. Doesn't seem like facts to us, but they're facts to them. So what's their perspective? What's their emotion? What are the emotions that go with that perspective? The empathetic concern is a deeper level. And I don't think many times we go to that level with people unless it's really close friends, family, people we really care about. Someone described, you know that you're an empathetic concern when you not only feel where the other person is coming from, you'll say, I have their back. You are right there with them. So I think the goal for all of us for sure on empathy is to say, let's go to the cognitive and look at the perspective. Then let's stop. The next step is what emotions may go with that cognitive and that perception? Because if we can come from understanding them both analytically and emotionally, we are in a much more powerful place to be able to influence them and support them. So think about the importance of empathy. So as we think about listening and empathy, we're now into this category of reactions to change. And it's like the dominoes. One change so often leads to other changes. And it just kind of snowballs and we feel overwhelmed. So one of the things I found was to try and diagnose how are the people reacting to whatever change they're dealing with. So I came across years ago, I worked with in a change program these four categories of reactions that people have to change. I wanna just briefly describe them and then go back and give a strategy or a tactic to deal with each one of these. So disorientation is confusion. People are stuck. They don't know what to do next. They've gotten all confused about the priorities. Think about how many times during the day you have your priorities change on you. What do I do next? I had one employee who was like sitting at her desk, just staring at her desk. She had no idea. She actually almost looked like this picture on the slide. She had no clue what she should do next. So that's the disorientation. Just where am I? What do I do? The disenchantment, I probably don't need to describe very much because we all recognize it. It's the anger. It could be nonverbal, but usually it's verbal. And we know that the person is unhappy and dissatisfied and they 
they seem to have a limitless ability or time to be able to share it. They just keep going on and on, but they're angry. The disidentification is kind of a different term, but it's people having to let go of things that they used to do. So there's a sadness to it. And what it means is you're trying to get them to identify with the present and with going forward with where we need to go. And they're kind of identifying more with the past. So you want them to look forward and they're looking backwards. And they're saying, this used to be a good place to work. We used to really work well together. And they, they'll start listing all these characteristics and what it was so wonderful in the past. And they feel like they're having to give all of that up. So that's the disidentification. Identification with the past rather than the where you want them to go with the present or with the future. Disengagement, we know it's withdrawal. People just pull back. They're no longer contributing. Ties in with a lot of studies today about they've looked at are people engaged or not. And a lot of the studies will say only sometimes 30% of less of employees are really engaged today, which means the majority of people have withdrawn and have disengaged to some level. So if you think about these four reactions, let me go back and say, what can you do about each one? With the confusion and what I did with my employee is I sat down with her and said, let's look at everything on your desk. Let's look at our priorities. And what we did is we talked it through I re-clarified for her why we were doing certain things. An important part of helping someone be oriented is to understand the why. And then we made a list of what needed to be done next, and then after that, and after that. So in reality, she had a roadmap of how to tackle the things that were on her desk. She then was oriented to the priorities and what needed to be done. That unstuck her, and she was able to move forward. Anger, I found, is sometimes challenging to deal with because there's so much energy and they're so worked up. But part of it is to say to them, whoa, it's clear you're unhappy. What would you want it to look like? How can we get there? So it's like getting them to say, you're not happy. What would make it better? And then you try and take that energy and focus it toward the problem solving. So it's use the energy, but focus it toward problem solving rather than spinning and demonstrating to everyone how frustrated they are. So again, use the energy that's there. With the disidentification, it's being able to say to them, wow, it sounds like that was really a positive time in your work experience. What made it so special? What were the qualities? What were the characteristics when you look back on what you enjoyed doing that? And they'll start to describe it and you'll be able to say to them, those are really important qualities. How can we take those same qualities forward with us toward the future? So what you're doing is saying, if people worked closely together and they supported each other, what would it take for us to do that here? Those are important qualities we don't want to lose. Um, being able to identify resources, finding out ways to collect them, being innovative. But what you're doing with the disidentification is you're pulling things from the past that can be used in the present going forward. And so what you're doing in reality is building a bridge from the past toward the present future, rather than having them feel like you're just wiping out the past. So how do you build that bridge and that connection? With the disengagement, it's really important to be able to acknowledge to the person how their contributions, their participation, their engagement had been so important in the past and you miss it and the group needs it. So what needs to happen to pull them back in? And if people have really withdrawn, I've said to them, I need to understand what's going on. I need to know how I can support you. And then I would sometimes give them questions to think about and say, I would really like you to take some time to say, what barriers are holding you back? What do you need to be able to connect with all of us again? What can any of us do? But more importantly, what can I do? 
and to say, please take some time to think about these questions and let's meet tomorrow because it's important for me to understand where you're coming from and what I can do. You do it with disengaged people. You only can do it one-on-one. -on -one. I don't think you can put them on the spot in front of others and you need to give them some questions, but then time to think about their answers. The goal is you're you're saying, how can I re-engage these people? And you need to work with them in a dialogue to figure that out. So disorientation needs a plan. Anger needs to focus that energy toward problem solving. Disidentification needs to have that bridge built from the past to the present. And disengagement needs to be finding ways to re-engage them. But when you're looking at that change in those reactions, communication becomes really important. The person I learned the most from on this was William Bridges. And he wrote several books on transitions. And he said, in the uncertainty, we are in transitions. But he said, whenever you're in times like that, you need to communicate, communicate, communicate. Multiple times, multiple ways. When people are stressed, and scared, it actually starts to shut down their listening and they don't hear everything or they'll hear a partial message. Start a meeting off with people saying, we have to make major budget cuts and people's minds will take off on all sorts of directions on what that's going to mean to them and they will miss part of the message. So if you communicate the same message multiple times, multiple ways, they'll start to get it. But one of the formulas that I really like that Bridges shared, and I use this in this leadership class that I teach and have people draft one and share with each other how they could use this formula. It's to say, first off, in your message to people, how can you demonstrate your care and your concern? And that goes back to empathy. You're acknowledging where they're coming from. You're acknowledging the emotions and you're being supportive to them. So then it's demonstrating that care and concern. And then the part, the next part I think is really important on the specifics of the message is these four categories. When you think about what's a motivating environment for people, a lot of people would say, I wanna make a difference. I wanna know that the work I'm doing is connected with where the organization is going. And so one of the ways you can do that is to cover these four areas. The purpose is the why are we doing it? What is it tied to? Why is it important to the organization? What's the big picture? Is it the competitor? Is it what's happening? So it helps kind of give support to the purpose. Here's our plan on what, who we're going to tackle this, but here's your part within it. Um, and then they can see how the work they're doing is aligned all the way up to the purpose for the organization. I found what works worked the best for me was to start with the part and to say, let's look at the work you're doing. The work you're doing is tied to this department plan, which is actually tied to the, in that case, I was in human resources, to the human resources plan. Here's the bigger picture, but the most important thing is here's the purpose. Years ago, I did some training with the Veterans Administration and I was dealing with people in the VA hospitals and I had cross-functional teams together and they were really kind of bickering at each other. And before I had a chance to really intervene, one of the participants kind of demonstrating informal leadership spoke up and said, remember our purpose. And their purpose in the VA hospital is what are we doing for the veteran? It's very clear, there's no questions. And all of a sudden it stopped them. It aligned them completely with, this is the purpose, this is why we're doing it. How do we use the resources and our ideas from the different departments to pull off this particular project or um, plan that they were doing. So that was to me a wonderful example of how aligning people with their work tied to the purpose can be incredibly powerful. So as you're communicating during change, think about the care and concern and then covering these four areas so people can see that link of what they're doing. So not only do they wanna know that they're making a difference and that it's lined with where the organization is going, one of the other things that 
Bridges and many others have talked about is then how do we demonstrate and show that we appreciate their efforts. So that's the recognition piece and verbally acknowledging the extra effort they may be doing. So that's one way to communicate in a formula that I found really works when people are in change. So one of the things we also have to look at is tips for virtual communications. And so much has been written about this, particularly in the last 18 months, because it's been our world. Everything's been virtual communications. And several of the authors that I've looked at have talked about we always communicate in groups and we check in with people, but they're in groups. How are you doing? And people kind of share with each other. But they said one thing with all the uncertainty, you need to have that personal one on one communication. It may take some extra time, but it can make a significant difference on how engaged people are. So think about the importance of the one on one. During that, you're checking in with them, not just on the task, but it's how are you? How can I support you? What do you need? And you start to find out, are there barriers? Are there resources they need access to? Are they struggling with some part of the technology that's getting in the way for them? And then the important thing when you ask those questions is obviously to go back to demonstrating the listening skills we talked about earlier. And then with that information, respond as needed. So communications becomes a really important part of anything that we're doing during these times of uncertainty. When I think about influence in general, I wanna come back to a new resource that just came out this last year. And it was written by a colleague and a friend of mine, Glenn Parker, and he co-authored it with his son, Michael. And he said, this influence is so important today. And that gets back to the leadership behavior. But he, they defined in all the research interviews they did, they came up with four styles of influence. So it was like, how do we support? Our, is your style more supportive? Is your style more teaching, giving information, guiding others? Is it more that inspirational motivator? Or are you the role model and people really watch what you're doing and want to be like you? So in his book, he has an assessment that you take, which will show you probably use all four styles, but which ones do you use the most? So I wanted to share with you because it's a relatively new resource that's come out. So we've looked at the listening, the empathy, some of the change reactions, but one of the things that I saw in a webinar this summer that really impacted me, because it was a resource I wasn't aware of, was I'd heard people talk about psychological safety, but this person referenced Timothy Clark's book, The Four Stages of Psychological Safety, and it really hit home for me because it made me stop and go, whoa. A lot of people aren't feel, feeling very safe in our environment today to speak up or to express their opinion. So I would bring us back again to our circle of influence to be able to say on this subject, look within your team, look within your department, look within your, your immediate area on the psychological safety. So the four stages of the psychological safety is to say, do people feel included? Do they feel like they belong? Do they feel a part of the team? Because they need to be at that level first before they're really comfortable going to the next level, which is the learning stage. And in the learning stage, people ask questions, they establish a dialogue, there's a great exchange of information. They're also open to feedback, and whenever in classes, whenever I use the word feedback, people go, oh, I don't want it. In reality, feedback is data. So giving someone a compliment is also a form of feedback. So being open to feedback and to give feedback can also mean that we're reinforcing what people are doing well. And sometimes we need to do constructive feedback. So being open to feedback is both the reinforcing and the constructive, but that learning, the dialogue, the exchange of information, that will lead you into the third stage, which is, wow, based on that dialogue and that exchange, this is how I can contribute. This is how I can use my knowledge, my experience, my skills to help us on solving this problem, which enriches the process for everyone. I think the fourth stage, 
I didn't see all the time. So I'll be honest about that. Because the fourth stage is where you really challenge, where you have the courage to stay up and say, whoa, what we have just come up with is probably not going to work, but for these reasons. And this is, I don't want us to make a mistake. This is how we need to course correct and to challenge. So I would ask all of you to think about your work group, your team. What stage of psychological safety do you believe that you are at? And how could you help move that to the next stage? What could you and your behavior do? Could it be people aren't feeling that they belong? How can we probe? How can we pull them in? How can we help them feel more included? How can we reinforce the dialogue? How can we increase the contributions? And even at the contribution level, some people won't contribute unless someone asks them a question or pulls their contribution. So what can we do to move our way through these stages of psychological safety? But again, bring it back into your immediate frame of reference, your team, your world. Okay, so that one to me is important. Then we talked about having the importance of innovation. We really need to figure out different ways to do things. And so to have innovation, you do need some level of psychological safety or people aren't going to speak up. But the other thing we really need is the creative use of limited resources. I have heard for the last 20 years, people are saying we have to do more with less. Well, we really have to do more with less. Think about all the things we're exposed to now where there's lower staff levels, people are trying to pick up extra work, we're not always clear on the priorities. So innovation, it's like, what does it need to get us to get more creative about using those limited resources? And what I think is really important for innovation to take place is to be flexible, and to have strong networks. When I changed jobs and went into the utility, I knew nothing about the utility world. I'd come from high tech and I knew nothing about the utility world. So I started touring the power stations. I started going to different departments, connecting with people, asking them about their job. Um, people really like to talk about their jobs if it's a sincere interest. But it also gave me a chance to start creating my network that when later, when I needed to know some information, I had names of people to call. There's a local author who wrote a book quite a few years ago, but I still reference it because I think it was so helpful. And the book was on networking. Harvey McKay wrote it. And the book title was Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty. Build your network before you need it. So having those networks, you can't know everything. You can have good ideas about where to go. And it isn't always on Google. I personally prefer to go to people, but I will admit that you can certainly get a lot of information. And I won't mention the names of the, the tools because I might have an answer coming back at me from um, my device in the living room here. So think about the other thing that you need to do is how to try new approaches, but people get really worried about suddenly changing something. So what I found is what really works for people is to how do we pilot it? How do we do it on a shorter time frame? Let's try this for a month and then let's stop and reevaluate it and then tweak it and then move forward. People are much more willing to try a new approach for a short period of time, knowing that it's going to be looked at and that you're not locked into it forever. I was doing some work at Mayo years ago. They were looking at one of their major issues was scheduling to have the 24-7 and scheduling was always a headache. So a team came up with an approach and the leader of the group said, Ooh, I don't think this is going to work, but they came up with it. So let's try it. And it was putting people into three different groups. So it was a three month pilot and it was their idea. He agreed to it. And at the end of the three months, he said, I don't believe it. That was so effective. And so they went forward with it. So Bridges would say, when you're trying temporary measures to kind of band-aid something, sometimes those temporary measures are so effective that they become permanent. But many times it's starting out by piloting it first. Then how do we learn from our mistakes? And that's the tough part because people feel like they're gonna be embarrassed, they're gonna feel stupid. It's like pull the learning from it. 
um, there was a great quote from Life's Little Instruction book that I loved, and it said, we overuse the words, if only, we need to substitute to next time. And think about when we've made a mistake, we can't ignore it, we made a mistake, but it's a matter of saying, whoa, that did not go well. If only I hadn't said or done that, but I did it. So what did I learn from it? Because the next time I try this approach, I am going to be better because of what I learned from the mistake I just made. So learning from our mistakes is sometimes hard to do, but it can be very powerful. And then for innovation, we also really need brave collaboration. And I love the term brave collaboration, but I was pulling my resource before the session today and I thought, here were some of the other words. I used what I figured was an easier phrase, but this with this particular set, well, with innovation, you need collaboration. So the other terms they used was, what does it require? It requires creative abrasion. It requires constructive dissent. It's a process that relies on high intellectual friction, but low social friction. And that translates all into brave collaboration. So think about how you can build these things into your work to get that innovation to help us find new ways to approach what we're going to do with the limited resources that we have. And managing the speed of change, I told you at the beginning that I wanted to bring it back to you and the self-management and what can you do to take care of yourself. And I found that these qualities, which some of these are strengths of mine and some of them can kind of derail me. So think about, can you stay positive? Can you look for the opportunity in things? Hard to do when a lot of people are coming at you with negative messages. I have sometimes been accused when I try and stay too positive. I actually had over the years, someone asked me if I was on medication. So I think you have to tone down the positive, but you still look for the opportunities. The focus is think about trying to stay focused on the priorities, what needs to be done next. Being flexible, I've already mentioned the importance of being agile. We have things coming at us all the time that are new, but then to try and stay organized. And we all have different ways of being organized, but if you get disorganized or we're busy, but we're not getting much done because we can't find what we need. And then how can we anticipate what's coming at us so we can be proactive about dealing with it before it's right in our face? And I would say, I would ask you to think about these five characteristics and qualities and which ones are your strengths and which ones when you're under a lot of pressure derail you. And I will say personally, the ones that will really get me is when I get stressed and tired and I'm overwhelmed, I lose my focus which fragments my energy, and that then creates more disorganization. So it means that I need to stop, step back from it, and be able to say, wait a minute, how do I get my focus back, use my energy more effectively? And in connection with that, just about two weeks ago, I think in the Minneapolis Star paper here, um, in a column that's in the business section, the author, highlighted a new resource and it kind of ties with this whole thing on resilience and, and for me on getting focused. So I'm looking forward to getting this book. It was written by Kevin Cashman and it's called The Pause Principle. And what we need to do is to step back and pause. And what, what we get by doing that, and I just need to look at my notes here because I haven't read the book, but it's like if we step back and pause, it can help us recharge. It can help us gain that clarity that we're missing and it can help us foster innovation. And I think that ties so much with what we're talking about today on how do we deal with these uncertain times. So think about today, I wanted to look at what your role is, what your impact is, what you can do with this change, the change reactions in the environment, how can you create some psychological safety? Can you move into that innovation that we all need to be more creative, to be able to move forward? And most importantly, how can you take care of yourself? So my final thoughts are that leaders and remember informal leaders need to influence others. They need to support them to help them reach their personal and organizational targets 
and somehow do it with the agility and the flexibility that we all need. So with that, I will turn it over to Lisa for the Q&A. I think I've done it with the time that we're supposed to have for that, so. Yes, that was perfect. Thank you so much, Marilyn. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom on this topic. Um, we will now move to the Q&A portion of this webinar. Um, we have a lot of really great questions. Um, I do want to say I put this in the chat, but if we don't get to your question in time or if we don't address it, um, please email Marilyn. I put the email address in the chat as well, and she will respond to your question. Uh, so the first question we have, um, the listener says, how do we or our employees increase empathy while protecting ourselves and themselves from burnout? It's a really good question because one of the comments I meant to highlight under empathy, so this question brings me to that point, is some of us have the ability to be more empathetic and to really connect with people's emotions. But we have to really be careful that we don't get absorbed by their emotions. And I have just recently been coaching a couple of people, which is a good reminder to me that when you are connecting with others and that empathy is there, you still need to hang on to your own boundaries. And so you have to be clear with the energy that you have, how much can you help them? And so sometimes we have to be as humble to realize we may not have the energy we'd like to have to do as much for them. But what we can do is then help identify other resources that could be helpful to them. Because I think it's so real to guard yourself against burnout because you can get pulled in so much into somebody else's emotions. And even when I worked in Australia as a consultant, a lot of my job was to challenge and to help people to push them a little. And after being there two months, I was starting to over identify with their issues. And I found myself explaining why they couldn't do something and I'm now colluding. So I lost my boundary. I lost my ability to stay objective. So there's the part about how can you support them, but do it in a way that doesn't take too much of your energy or it won't be effective for them or for you. Yeah, thank you. And. Um... I was always thinking of that part that's uh, somebody has referred to in the airlines where you make sure you have your mask on before you put it on someone else. So uh, that's just something I was thinking about. That's a good one. Um, um, so the second question, um, also all great questions. Um, so where do you as a leader draw the line between being empathetic and counseling? So um, you mentioned this earlier, but the a uh, listener gives an example of referral to an EAP program versus, you know, continuing a conversation and helping them that way. I think it's really important to know your own skill set, and most leaders have to really guard against being a counselor and to know what resources that have, particularly what I found if it's a business issue, I was much more comfortable getting involved in dealing with it. If it had to do with a personal issue and had to do with dysfunction or things in their personal life, that is completely beyond my skill level. Not that I wouldn't be able to support them to some extent, but for me to help them guide them or counsel them, I'm not trained to do that. So I think it's a part about really being clear about what is my skill set and where do I know I should not step over the line because professionals need to work with them. It's tricky also to try and be a counselor to take it too far because you have the work relationship as an element. One of the advantages to going to a professional is not only are they trained, but they have the ability to stay objective and to ask you the challenging questions, but to be there to to support you and they don't have a history they don't have a daily relationship with you and i think that can actually help in that kind of a um, supportive role yeah absolutely um the third question we have is um, how do you address disengagement when there is distrust <laughs> well i think part of it is you have to acknowledge that I mean, you can't pretend that it's not there. Um, to be able to bring up the trust issue um, and to ask the person, what would they need to be able to trust another person or the situation? People have been wounded many times by past circumstances and that puts up that wall of distrust. 
Um, and sometimes they can't trust their boss. So part of it is if you try and talk with them one-on-one -on -one and you sense that there's a real trust problem, then I would say, is there someone else that could talk to them where they might have more trust? Would you feel comfortable talking with someone else? Because we want to have people to trust us, but sometimes we don't know always the impact we've had on people and there could be an element of distrust. And so who else could help them? But you can't ignore that it's there because otherwise you're just hitting your head against the wall and they're just gonna withdraw further. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, and we wouldn't want that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, so one uh, listener says, I work in a predominantly shame-based organization mm -hmm. that is recognized internationally as a leader in the field. Um, human resources mostly sees employees as problems, less as valued human beings. How do you reconcile and navigate an organization that promotes evidence-based customer-facing practices while practicing internally obsolete, ineffective managerial methodologies. Oh, I think I, I wish I <laughs> Oh, they have more. So. Oh, 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 my goodness. Oh, okay. Uh, as a marginalized staff member without power, how can you be a catalyst to solve this organization, organizational cognitive, cognitive dissonance? My apologies. I will repeat whatever you'd like for me to repeat. <laughs> no, I was just thinking about um, one of the things at the beginning of the question is where you, the organization projects a completely different image about how they treat people, but it's not how they treat their employees. And there was a wonderful book that came out years ago that said the customer comes second. And what the person was saying is how we treat our employees is how they will treat the customer. So they were always saying you start with your employees. Obviously that's not true in this organization where they're starting with the customer at the expense of the employees. And dealing with difficult situations like that and you're feeling marginalized, it's kind of like, I would say, how do you find some allies? How do you find some support? How do you reach within your, I mean, you're bringing your circle of influence even to a smaller level to say, how can I survive here? Because when I used to teach a class in handling difficult people, which also ties with handling difficult situations, they said there's one of three options that we all have. When we are in a really challenging, tough situation that's gut-wrenching and wearing us down, we need to say, how can I fix it? Who, what resources would I need? Who can help me? If I've tried that, it takes a lot of energy and commitment, that isn't working, then I have to say, what can I do to cope with it? I mean, how can it? And I know a couple of people who dealt, lived in really horrible places and they said, I just let it roll off my back. And I thought, wow, I don't know if I could do that, but they could. So fix it, cope with it. And then if it's that uncomfortable, the third step is the tough one, but it may be the survival. And it's like, maybe I need to leave this organization because I'm not able to be who I want. And it's not an environment that I can thrive in. We image and leap to, oh, if I could only leave this organization. But I would challenge people to say, try and fix it if you can. Otherwise cope and one way to cope is to ally build, find people that think the way you do, that validate who you are and what you stand for. Because a lot of times people are in a tough organization, but they so believe in the work they're doing. It's just the people around them that are making it tough. And boy, that is a personal decision and I don't have an easy answer. Yeah, no, thank you. I think that that was <laughs> great to, um, to come with that. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, so it comes from someone who says, the positivity from management or leaders can sometimes trigger more anger or withdrawal. Um, so how can leaders be positive without becoming toxically positive? <laughs> well, well, okay, so toxically positive makes me think that the person is being positive, but unrealistically. I mean, they're being positive about something that no one else could possibly agree with. Um, so I always hoped that I was still realistic, but I was just a little, people would say I was Pollyanna or too positive. 
Um, part of it is to still look for the opportunities, but I think it's being able to say, what are the resources to do what they're saying, trying to ask questions. Um, I think if a leader comes across too positively into that toxic side, I think they lose credibility. Um, and so it's like, how do you monitor that? I found in one organization, the only way I could deal with something like that wasn't positivity, it was actually negative, but I couldn't deal with the executive myself, but I talked with one of their colleagues and asked them to challenge because I wasn't going to be able to get through, but who else could reach that person? I wasn't the one, but I could go to someone I trusted who did it for me. So I don't know if that helps because it's not an easy answer, but it's too bad because then it makes everyone cynical because it's like that can't happen. Who, what do they think? And then we're off and running in a negative direction, which we don't want to have happen. Yeah, that's an, I also fall, um, tend to be a super positive person. So I <laughs> understand that sometimes um, I, it can get into the realm of unrealistic um, unrealistic expectations. So um, we're actually going to um, move on. So thank you so much, Marilyn, for your time, your incredibly useful information. Um, I have put, again, Marilyn's uh, email address into the chat. So please take time to uh, write that down, record it somewhere so that um, if your question wasn't addressed, you can ask it again. Um, but again, thank you so much, Ma uh, Marilyn, for that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will send a link to the webinar recording within a week of today's presentation. If you enjoyed this webinar and you'd like to continue engaging in similar topics, please take a look at our upcoming professional development courses, or you can also register for our upcoming webinar, Lead Like an Ally, which is part of our current webinar series on leadership. My contact information is also on this slide if you'd like to learn more. And thank you again so much, everyone, for joining us today um, and engaging such great questions. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Take care, stay safe, and be well. Thank you, everybody. Take care.